Okay, in a moment we will begin. <clears throat> okay, dear friends, um, our topic for today, um, our consecutive topic, I would have to say, is Pirkei Avot, Chapter 1, Mishnah 16. It's a continuation. We have uh, one more Mishnah uh, after, two more Mishnah, excuse me, after this, to the end of the chapter. Now, um, Today's Mishnah is Rabban Gamliel. It was also referred to as Rabban Gamliel Hazaken, the elderly Rabban Gamliel. Hillel was also referred to in Talmudic literature as Hillel Hazaken, which seems to be a title which means the scholarly. Elderly in general in Judaism means a scholar. Um, you have two types of scholars. You have Zkenim, who are parallel to Shoftim, to judges, the elderly who are considered like judges. And uh, what they refer to sometimes in the Bible is Zikne Ha'ir, the elderly of the city, which means the wise men or the scholars or the judges of that city. And um, there's also Zaken uh, Ashmai, which means um, a person who's elderly in years. And um, as they say, Ezeu Zaken Shekana Chochma, there's a certain wisdom that comes with life experience. And that's why the Torah says, Mipnei Seva Takum, that you should stand before somebody who is elderly, because you have scholars and then you have life experience, which also gives knowledge in a different, uh, in a different way, a, a sort of practical knowledge of life. Now, Rabban Gamliel is brought here. Rabban Gamliel is the grandson of Hillel. Hillel's son, Shimon, and then Rabban Gamliel is the grandson. And he is the next in line as the president of the Sanhedrin. But if you notice, there are no zugot. They're not coming in pairs. There are five pairs, as I talked about before. And then there's another two, which is Rabban Gamliel. And then Shimon, his son. Another three, I would have to say. And then, yeah, no, Rabban Gamliel and Shimon. And then it says Shimon ben Gamliel, which is actually the grandson of that second uh, Shimon ben Gamliel. Uh, and then, of course, this, the next chapter, chapter two, two, starts with Rabbi, who is Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, who is also from that line of Hillel. What we have here is a line of presidents of the Sanhedrin, all descended from the Hillel dynasty, because the family of Hillel becomes the dynasty of presidents all the way to the end of the Sanhedrin. From this point, Hillel lives from before the common era till about 10 or 20 after the common era. Then you have his son Shimon, which is not mentioned here. Rabban Gamliel, the grandson is mentioned here, who lives in the, still in the first half of the common era. And then his son, Shimon, who is mentioned in the next Mishnah, actually learn, lives uh, during the Churban, which is during the destruction of Jerusalem. And it's brought down here, I think by Oh yeah, Kahati has some very interesting things to say about uh, this Mishnah, about Shimon. And he says he also was the head of the Sanhedrin, the president, during the destruction of the temple. And uh, that's why he's mentioned right after. Some people say he was actually killed by the Jewish zealots. Um, that's another opinion here, which would explain why it is not him, but um, Yochanan ben Zakkai, who stands at the head of Yavne after the destruction of the temple, if Shimon was actually killed, and then only later on does his son Gamliel II and Shimon ben Gamliel uh, II become the heads of the, the uh, Sanhedrin. But who was Yochanan ben Zakkai? Yochan ben Mezakai, who lives after Rabban Gabriel, during the time of Shimon ben Gamliel, uh, of course, the famous story of Yochan ben Zakai, how he tried to save Jerusalem. But first of all, who was he? The Talmud in Sukkah says that there were 80 students of Hillel, and many of the, and all of them were great enough that they deserved the divine presence, meaning Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit to come upon them if their generation would have been a different generation. The greatest among them, the Talmud says, was 
Yonatan ben Uziel. And the, you might say, the least among them was Yochanan ben Zakkai, who became the head of Yavne. In other words, they mean even this great scholar, <laughs> just to understand who Hillel was, this great scholar was the last in line because there were such great people um, who uh, were descendants of Hillel. Now, there's something interesting going on here. As I said, <clears throat> first of all, about Rabban Gamliel, even though he's one instead of two, it doesn't say Kibel Mimenu. It doesn't say he received anything uh, from Hillel and Shammai. Of course, he was a descendant. He was a grandson, but it doesn't say he received anything. And there are those who picked up on this, um, that it doesn't say Kibel Mehem. So what does this mean? So some people say that the reason why it doesn't say uh, Kibel Mehem is because during the time of Hillel and Shammai, there were so many disputes, especially from between the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai, that the Torah was not a unified Torah anymore. So it's hard to say he received. There were too many divisions, too many points of view. And therefore the word received is gone. So it doesn't say the Rabban Gamliel received, it just said, he said. And this is the way it continues um, from now on. However, in Avot Rabbi Natan, which I've mentioned multiple times, this book from the Geonic period, which is sort of like the Talmud or the Gemara of the chapters of Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, right after the Mishnah that talks about Shammai, which we talked about last week, it skips out all of these three Mishnahs at the end of this chapter and the beginning Mishnahs of chapter 2 and jumps over in chapter 2 where it talks about Yohanan ben Zakkai, a student of Hillel. And Avot Rabbi Natan, in a very unusual and possibly political way, <laughs> says Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai received from Hillel and Shammai. Because there were 80 students of Hillel, the elderly. Here it says 30 uh, deserved to have uh, the presence, God's presence upon them like Moshe, like Moses. But their generation was not worthy. And another 30 um, were worthy of setting of Laber uh, Shanim, to create leap years, which means to be in such a court. And there are another 20 who were um, more mediocre scholars. That makes 80 altogether. The greatest among them, I mentioned Yonatan ben Uziel. And the least among them, Yohanan ben Zakkai. But they said about Yohanan ben Zakkai that he was so scholarly, just to understand what the least means, he knew all of Torah, all of the Mishnah, all of the Gemara, all of the laws, all of the Agadot, all of Toseftot, all the Dikduke uh, Torah, which means all the various um, minute of the Torah and the various versions of the Sofrim and all of the traits, the good traits of a scholar. And there was nothing that he did not study. So he was like the epitome of scholarship and he was considered the least. But the interesting thing here is they skip over the rest <laughs> of uh, the Hillel family, and all of a sudden becomes Yochan ben Zakkai, the student who was the head of Yavne um, a generation later after the destruction of the temple. And it actually says the word Kibel he received. Is this a political statement, meaning it should have been Yochan ben Zakkai and not the family of Hillel? I don't know. <laughs> I would have to ask whoever wrote about the Rabbi Natan, but it's definitely a statement. Where in the Mishnah it doesn't say Kibel, but with Yochanan and Zakkai, and in our version in uh, in chapter two, it also doesn't say the word Kibel with uh, Yochanan and Zakkai, but the Avot Rabbi Natan does. Oh, excuse me, it does in chapter two. Yes, it does. But that's also an interesting point. But the point is Avot Rabbi Natan skips out until that Mishnah, and that Mishnah, which is chapter two. In the regular Pirkei Avot, it's chapter 2 all the way um, to Mishnah 
excuse me. Eight. It's the eighth Mishnah. Yechaman Zakai Kibel Mi Halal of Hashama. Just also question on Avot. Why does Avot say about him that he's Kibel he received from Hillel Shammai and only place him in chapter 2, Mishnah 8? Why not right after Rabban Gamliel at the time of Shimon when he actually lived? Now, it could be out of respect for the Hillel family. It could be out of the understanding of the importance of the Hillel family. It could also be for the fact that Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, who is the editor, the redactor of the Mishnah, is also from the Hillel family. It's also a possibility, right? So put things in there, the place that you want to put them. But of course, he does record that Yochanan ben Zakkai did receive from Hillel Shammai. And the fact that it says the word receive with Yochanan ben Zakkai puts him in a direct link, which almost seems to override all these generations which are mentioned here at the end of chapter one. But they were the heads of the Sanhedrin. Yochanan ben Zakkai were the head was the head of Yavne. Okay. Now, for those who don't remember the story, I will quickly tell the story of Yochanan ben Zakkai, who lives during the time of Shimon. And the story was, as there was a siege around Jerusalem for three years, this is told in the Talmud and Gittin in the fifth chapter. So, there was a fight, and the zealots of Jerusalem the Biryonim did not want anybody to leave the city to attack the Romans because they saw this as a fight to the end and there will be no compromise, even if we lose. Well, Yochanan ben Zakkai didn't think that was a good idea and he saw the end in sight and he wanted to talk to the Romans. So he spoke to his brother-in-law who was actually in charge of the military zealots or militant zealots, whatever you want to call them. His name was Abba and he said to him, if we lose this war, everything goes. I want to talk to them. Abba Chukya says, look, I'm not going to tell you no, I understand you. But, you know, it's greater than me at this point. <laughs> They're not going to listen to me if I let you out of the city. So he said, okay, so tell me what I should do, because I trust you. So Abba Chukya said to Yochanan, he says, tell your students that you're not well. Then after a while, the students will say that you died. And according to Jewish law, you must be buried outside the city. You take it from there. Yochanan understood. And uh, he told his students that he wasn't well. Of course, one or two students understood were in the secret of this plan. And they were the ones who were going to carry him. So, and that's what they said. They told everybody he wasn't well. And then after a week or two, they said that he was terminally ill and that he had died. And then, of course, they have to bury him outside the city and then they'll be, you know. So they put him into a coffin, but they make sure that only those two students hold the coffin, the Talmud says, because a dead person weighs more than a live person. So the students are going towards the entrance of the city. And sure enough, the, the militias or with the militant Biryonim Zelots are there, and they say, why are you leaving the city? He says, what do you mean, why? Because we have to bury our master. He says, well, how do you know he's dead? I said, what do you mean, how do you know he's dead? <laughs> you can open the coffin of uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai. He says, well, just put a sword in it. How about that? You're going to put a sword <laughs> in the body of this great scholar? What's wrong with you? He says, okay, we won't put a sword. Let, we'll just juggle it a little bit. He said, come on, you're going to juggle it. Uh, just let us go and bury him said, okay, fine, fine. So they take him out of the city. And uh, the Talmud says, and Yochanan ben Zakkai gets out. And he's accomplished stage one. Now he has to uh, speak to uh, Titus. And uh, which is not a simple thing uh, to do. Uh, there are different things, whether it's a Vespasian, it's not exactly clear here, if it was Vespasian or Titus. But anyhow, he goes to the Caesar. Uh, excuse me, he goes to the general and he says to him, Shalom Alecha, uh, Shalom Alecha, uh, Malki, Shalom Alecha, Malach, I greet you with peace, O oh my king. The general looks at him and says, Who are you? Explains who he is. Says, You know, you deserve the death penalty twice. <laughs> he says, Twice? Why twice? 
This is the first one because I'm just a general. I'm not Caesar. You can't call me king. That could be the death penalty in Rome. And secondly, if you really think I'm the king, three years I've been here at siege <laughs> on this city. You didn't give me respect even once during those three years. How come all of a sudden? So, Yochanan says, well, I'll answer number two before number one. Number two, why couldn't I get here before? I wasn't allowed to. They're within our brethren. They don't let us leave the city. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do it. Number one, I'm calling you a king because in our tradition, it says that the, the Lebanon, which means Jerusalem, will only fall in the hands of the greatest, and the greatest can only be a king. So if it's going to fall in your hands, you must be the king. As he was talking, the Talmud says, uh, emissary came from Rome with a letter. He says, letter, very important letter for the general. So he came and showed him, and the letter said, Caesar just died, and the Senate in Rome has elected you the new Caesar. Caesar. Well, he was in shock, <laughs> so, and he turned to um, Yochanan. He says, I don't know how you knew this, but obviously today is a good day. So whatever you came to ask me, ask me, you can have it. What is it? Yochanan says, how about three? He says, okay, what are they? Number one, give me Yavne and its sages. I want to rebuild a communal um, form of scholarly leadership and judicial leadership for the people. He says, okay, you got it. What else? He says, I want the Gamliel family. By the way, the Gamliel family is the family from Hillel, <laughs> the scholars from the house of Hillel. He says, okay, what else? He says, I want the family of Rabbi Tzadok, who is the high priest, the family of the high priest from the temple. He says, okay, you got that too. While telling this story, the Talmud tells this story in Gittin. And while telling the story, Rabbi Akiba, who is there while the story is being tell, told, because he has something to say. After the story is told, he says, sometimes, as it says in Proverbs, meshiv chachamim achor, sometimes even great scholars lose their power of reason. Why didn't Yohanan ask for Jerusalem? <laughs> Rabbi Akiva was stumped by this. Why didn't he ask for Jerusalem? Of course, the obvious answer is maybe he thought that he would never get. <laughs> so at least ask for something you have a chance of getting. Why ask for something that you don't have a chance of getting? Because if they had a siege for three years, not likely that they would have gotten Jerusalem. However, it appears that even Yochanan himself wondered about that question. Because the Talmud in Brachot, in chapter 4, brings a story that when Yochanan ben Zakkai was on his deathbed, his students said to him, O oh, Rabbi, teach us something that we will be able to merit the world to come. And then... Um, Yochanan said, okay, may your fear of heaven be at least like the fear of humans. Students said, that's it. He said, of course. Look, when a, when a criminal steals something, what do you think he's thinking? He's not thinking about God. He's thinking, which human being is going to see me? So if you would fear God the way people fear people, that would already be enough merit. And then they said, um, <clears throat> Rabbi, what's wrong? He says, look, I am standing before the king of kings, and there is no way to bribe him. <laughs> and nothing I can say, he knows all my deeds. And I don't even know if I'm going to heaven or hell, and you don't think I should be afraid? So, and then it says, at the time of his death, he said, take out the vessels so they don't become contaminated by his deceased body and prepare a chair for Hezekiah, the king of Judah, which he could see in an image. 
So Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Kuk once interpreted this passage in the Talmud of Rachot. He said, how could it be Yochanan ben Zakkai, this great scholar, a student of Hillel, is fearful because he doesn't know whether he's going to go to heaven or hell? <laughs> if he's fearful, what are we going to do? <laughs> What's this all about? So Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda would explain, says, Yochanan ben Zakkai, was worried about the same thing Akiva was worried about. His whole life, it ate him up. The question of what if, what if I would have asked for Jerusalem? Would I have gotten it? And he said, because of that, he didn't know if he was going to heaven or hell. But when he saw the image of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, Hezekiah, when Sancherib, the king of Assyria, came and made a siege around Jerusalem and wanted to destroy the city, God saved the city because of Hezekiah. And when he saw that Hezekiah, who was in his days Jerusalem was saved, came to greet him, then he knew that there was nothing he could have done to save Jerusalem anyway. But it bothered him his whole life. But as I said, it's not Yochanan ben Zakkai mentioned here, which Avot Rabbi Natan skips over to. And it's true, the mission Avot actually says Kiblu. It's very interesting that he, he received Kibel, which does not say about Rabbi Gamliel. So Gamliel then, Rabbi Gamliel I, who's known as the elder, has three things to say in his statement. In a time where there's a lot of controversy and a lot of division in the first century of the common era, we had this before, by the way. Make for yourself a teacher. And keep away from doubt. And don't, and don't try to give the tithes by guessing too often. <laughs> I have to explain that in a moment. First of all, what's the first part? We already had there that already. So why a second time? So the Kathy brings here, and it's very interesting, but an explanation, he says, it's not about study, it's about teaching. The previous statement earlier in the chapter where we said, have a, make for yourself a rabbi and have um, a good friend, that's about for yourself, for teaching. Everybody needs somebody to inspire them, everybody needs a friend to confide in. But this is different. Rabban Gamliel is talking to the teachers and to the judges. You need a rabbi in order to keep away from doubt. You see, there are a lot of people who are talented and either are or will be scholars because of their intellectual talents. But even people like this need a guide, need a mentor. And even if eventually they will be greater than their mentor, they need a mentor. Because through this process of discussion with the other, you can figure out your own mistakes. That's why the Talmud was so um, adamant about having a chevruta, somebody to study with a partner. It's a terrible thing to be by yourself. It's like the sword. You need to study with a partner because that's how things get clarified. And it doesn't matter who's greater than whom. Asir Kharav, make for yourself a mentor, a rabbinic mentor, and it doesn't matter if he's greater or you're greater, or if he's now greater and eventually he will be. Put the ego aside. In this relationship, it will clarify many things for you. And besides, never belittle experience. And because it's very important to cut down the doubt. We are humans, we make mistakes, but we can minimize the mistakes. The Talmud recognizes this. The Talmud in Sanhedrin says, Beit Din If a court made a mistake in judgment, you go back, you start over again. You don't say, well, the court said, if the judges realize there was a mistake, you just do it over again and clarify it. 
The judges are not infallible. They're scholars, but they're not infallible. So you need this interaction, this interface with a mentor, a Rav, and this will keep you minimalizing your mistakes and also minimalize your safek, your doubt. Now, there are a couple interpretations here. Uh, don't guess when you're giving the tithe. Now, the truth is that with the tithe, you're not supposed to guess. It's one-tenth. However, with truma, which is what we give the coin, um, rabbinically 2%, but from the Torah, anything, that you're allowed to, um, let's say, take a scholarly guess of what the 2% is. Because since the obligation from the Torah is anything, and the 2% is rabbinic, so you don't have to actually measure it, you can take what looks like 2% and that give uh, to the Kohen. Another thing that you're allowed to, um, also, I'm using the term guess, but it means, um, uh, you know, look at it and, and measure it just in your eyes without actually having to measure it exactly, is also Maser Ksafin, which is also a question whether it's an obligation from the Torah, what's what we call monetary ties. Is it an obligation from the Torah? Is it a rabbinic obligation? Is it just a nice custom based on the story of Jacob in, in Breshit? Um, that anything God gives me, I will give a tenth. So since it's not clear in that also, the tenth could be something which is estimated. That's probably the better word. So here it says, don't give your maaser by estimation. So some people say that even though the truma and the maaser safim you can do by estimation, don't do it too often. It's not good to get used to guessing, <laughs> especially for a scholar. However, others say that the whole thing is a mashal, the whole thing is a metaphor. And he also brings this down in the, uh, in the Kahati, which means, in general, in teaching Torah, it's um, not good to do it by estimation. You have to try to get down to clarity. Don't just fudge through it. <laughs> try to get to clarity. Try to understand the sources perfectly. Don't just say, okay, it appears like, spend the time, get to the bottom of it, and when you spend the time, it'll be much more clear to you. So, the, the it's, a, it's a metaphor of not to do things by estimation, meaning don't try to estimate teaching. Try to do it as clearly as possible. This will save you then from all the controversies. First, by having a good mentor, it'll save you from the doubt, and secondly, not doing things by estimation, but going back to the sources will also help you um, keep away from doubt. So these are hints of Shimon ben Gamliel, excuse me, of Rabbi Gamliel, the grandson of Hillel, who was the president of the Sanhedrin at the early part of uh, the first century while the temple was still alive. And next week we'll talk about Shimon Gamliel, Gamliel his son, who is the president of the Sanhedrin during the destruction of the temple. Okay, shalom, shalom, everyone, and Chodesh Tov.